OK, um, right. Thanks very much. Um, as as the, the holdings uh, slides were going through, I, I really liked the one of the young engineers working, working on the track, looking like they were having lots of fun. So that was a, that, that's a nice picture. Um, right. So this is an update of a talk I did very early on in the pandemic. I think it might have been the first time I did a, an online talk, um, which was managing risks from railway earthworks. So as I was updating this, I kind of my my job title has changed and the routes that I'm looking after has changed since I last spoke to you back in summer 2020. Um, so we had a putting passengers first changes to the to the regions and the routes and the East Midlands route is now being managed by a, an adjacent team. So um, so I, I deleted East Midlands from my my routes earlier. Um, when I was updating this and so th those are the kind of the big the big ticket um, items that used to be a route asset manager and it's now route engineer so um yeah so 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 the way eastern region looks now is as shown here so I look after as I said east coast and north and east route and my colleague Martin Wilson looks looks after east midlands and Anglia um so that's just to to show you where we are this is the team um, and so prior to the changes that came about about a year and a half ago with the, with PPF, the putting passengers and freight first, um, we used to have senior asset engineers within the team with they had an asset engineer or two working for them and they basically did everything. So they did maintenance. They responded to calls from control. If there was you know reports of any issue, they they dealt with our neighbours complaining about leaning fences. They dealt with, uh, you know, emergency response, um, as well as trying to plan for um, kind of, you know, future work. So, so dealing with our capital delivery teams on the renewals and dealing with our colleagues on enhancements. Um, they were also um, expected to do, carry out evaluations. Um, as well as kind of any investigations, et cetera. So, so we kind of, the, the teams were attempting to do everything um, together. So as part of this big change that we, we brought about, we streamlined the activities. So we've now got teams who are purely focused on maintenance activity, we've got teams looking at the renewals and enhancements, and then we've got separate compliance and support engineers and their teams. So I'll talk a little bit about them as we, as we go through. Um, the other big change that's happened since I last spoke to you and one which I'm very excited about is that we've brought our examiners in house. So that's that's the team in yellow there. So previously, our examinations used to be carried out by Amy. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, so they were externally um, company. They're now an in-house team and I'll talk a little bit about that about that as well. They're, they're bedding in at the moment. So that's kind of the shape of the team. So I'll just try and remind myself and remind you why, why we're here. What, what is the purpose of having a geotechnical asset management team? So we are here in order to manage our earthworks assets as well as any ground related hazards. So um, things such as outside party slopes, so big hillsides that might be causing a risk, historic underground mine workings are if, if there's adjacent you know, activity in, in mines adjacent to the railway as well. And then our earthworks assets are specifically um, embankments, which are built up to allow the railway to, to pass to, over to lower ground um, and either soil cuttings or rock cuttings to, to, to go through high ground. So the little diagram on the bottom right shows you how we count our assets. So you draw an imaginary line down the middle of the earth, earthwork from the track, perpendicular to the track, uh, um, every 110 yards, roughly 100 metres. And that gives you one of these assets that we mentioned earlier, with having 36,000 assets. So, so, so it is a lot and it's a lot of data to manage. Um, and that, that's how we count them. OK, so that's that's why we're here. So then so so. so th the vision, my, my vision for our team is that we will fully understand the risks from our earthworks assets, from mining or any other ground related hazards, and that we'll mitigate those risks using the best tools and res resources. So we basically need to be able to predict, <laughs> prevent and respond to failures. So, so predicting, we need to improve our asset and our hazard knowledge. Preventing is that we need to be able to, to have really good programs of work that allow us to to prevent failures that, that, that would otherwise happen. 
um, from affecting safety or performance. And then when failures do happen, actually responding to them to kind of minimize the safety risk and performance impact. So that's kind of the essence of what we're what we're here for. Um, again, you, some of you may have seen some of these photos before, um, the, you know, but it's a good, good remind, reminder to, to remember what can go wrong with embankments. So, so I've put in there a note about incident versus failure. So we can have an earthwork failure. So that's very obvious. Some of those photographs are very obviously an earthwork failure. We also get incidents. So we get smaller um, things that are reported as earthwork failures because the earthwork is looking a bit, you know, a bit rough around the edges. Um, you often get things like um, the um, OLE on the East Coast mainline, for example, often has these kind of bulbous areas of, of concrete around the edges and then the ballast beneath it kind of moves down over the years and that's sometimes reported as, as earthwork failure. So there's things like that and it can affect performance. It may not be a true earthwork failure, but it's still something that we need to care about and, and, and understand how we can kind of prevent that impact. So that's our embankment type of incidents that can happen. And here's some cuttings where we get rock fall, we might get washouts. Um, the, the, the one on the top right or near the top right would be one that I would consider as an incident. So again, it can get reported as an issue, but it's 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 not a true earthwork failure. That one um, and some of the others you can see are quite obviously proper earthwork failures. Um, those are the kind of things that can go wrong with cuttings um, outside party slopes. You, you may not have seen all of these before. So top left is a hillside. Um, we, we called it at Unston, but it, it's down kind of towards Ch Chesterfield. And it was the whole hillside was moving and the toe of the landslip was coming up between the two rails. So you can see where it's being pushed up and you can see where it's distorting the troughing as well. Um, so, the, so, so that was one type. Then the one at Galcar on the bottom left, you can you can just make out. You can see that the, the the trackway has is dipped down, but then in the trackway you can see a line that cuts across it, and then around the back of it, and then back again, um, uh, kind of in the centre of the picture. And that's the back scar of of, of a slip that's heading down the hillside um, towards a I think it's a canal or a river. Um, the one in the middle is the Horsforth Mining Settlement. So, so this was a site where there was some uh, ground investigation going on in uh, adjacent land. And um, we, we have drawn the connection between that and settlement that happened. So if you, could, you, you should be able to make out that it looks as if the track has kind of lifted up. But in fact, what's happened is it's, it's, it's dropped down either side of that kind of raised, raised section. Um, the or trying to understand the detail of that is, is still ongoing. Um, and then the one at Morpeth, which is a, a an interesting one that is still ongoing. So, so there's been a history of track problems here um, over the years. And in the, the dashed yellow line kind of shows you where those track problems are manifesting. Um, and the OLE was also leaning um, and not, not performing properly. Back about five, maybe eight years ago, we actually we, we well we fixed we did some work to the railway embankment, which you should be able to make out where, where I've got the arrow going. Berm install 2016. I've even given myself a date there, um, and and that was intended to to stop it. We thought that 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 the it was the railway embankment was the problem. However, it wasn't. Um, the landslide itself actually extends right to the lower hillside, um, about 160 meters. So, so that's kind of the type of, of thing that can go wrong um, with our outside party slopes. So that is that. Uh, so why does it matter? I mean, it may seem obvious to everyone, but sometimes it's, it, it's worth pointing that out to ourselves. We can have you know, safety impact um, in both embankments and cuttings, uh, loss of support and obstruction of the line. Um, performance impact is obviously also very important to us. So this slide shows where the track has dropped down just there in the distance. And you can see the amount of ballast that's attempting to be added to, to hold it in place. And you can see the yellow speed boards. So that's just the kind of thing that can go wrong. Um, in eastern region, in the last two years, we've had a roughly well, over four million pounds worth of delay costs. Um, and over 55,000 delay minutes associated with earthworks related incidents, both failures and um, and incidents. 
So it's a kind of performance impact. Um, this is some new work that the, the team in Milton Keynes um, have done. It, it, it may not be that new. It's probably been there for about a year or so. Um, but it, it gather, it's gathering all of the data that, that we've got available in our, in our systems um, to show us the type of failures we've got. So this is... Yeah, so this is Eastern region and it show, each of the dots shows you where the failures have happened. This is um, gathered since 2003. So you can see the like, numbers of failures is nearly 300. Um, 125 of those have been embankments, which is about 0.6% of our assets have, have embankment assets have failed. But you can see that our soil cuttings and our rock cuttings in terms of percentage of assets which have failed, it is much higher than that, and rock cuttings is almost twice as many in terms of proportion as embankments. So that's kind of a, an interesting thing to see from the data, which is, you know, the data and understanding the data is getting better and better um, year on year. Um, so that is that failure is there. So, so this one is also um, a, a nice illustration. So when we record our earthwork failures, we record what kind of triggers or what 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 was happening to, to the earthwork just before. So um, you can see that the event triggers is hugely skewed towards um, rainfall and having saturated ground. So in a number of these um, here are from you know recent rainfall, but not heavy, recent heavy rainfall, um, rainfall after prolonged hot and dry weather, um, I can't quite see the other ones, but you can see that the you know wet wet ground is is a particular issue for us. But then rock cutting failures, and it, it probably isn't shown on this this diagram here. But if you do, if you drill into the data to look at the triggers for rock failures, it's generally due to general deterioration, so weathering of the rock, either the rock material itself or the you know between the blocks, the edges of of each block. You can have root jacking. Um, our ice jacking and, and just allowing trees to grow on our rock cuttings can mean that they, if they get blown off, they can, you know, they'll either fail and come down if 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 the blocks near them that they've been destabilizing comes down, or if they're blown over, they can pull blocks with them. Um, so so that's uh, our rock cutting failures, and then other kind of triggers can be either loading the crest. Um, animal burrowing, loss of support to the toe. So that might be due to scour or excavation. So those are the typical kind of triggers. And, and this is a really nice way to look at the look at that data. So back to my team and our team structure. So this is just reminding us of, of, of how the team looks at the moment. Um, and I'm going to. Oh, yeah. And, and, and so it is. So what we need to do is we need to predict, prevent and respond to failures. So the whole team help us do that. But then there's specific tasks and activities that each of the teams do that may be more around predicting or more around preventing or more around responding. Um, so, so the idea is the core part of the team, the, the people who are doing the actual kind of geotechnical stuff or the examinations, the maintenance and the renewals and enhancements, while the compliance team help us keep a track of all of that and make sure that we're doing things you know, in line with, with standards and that we're getting the, the right data we need to help us un understand uh, where we are and then the support team kind of ha, ha, I would say sitting in the background but quite often in the foreground helping us with the tools that we need and, and really trying to support the team in developing and, and continuous improvement so that's kind of how the team is structured um, so the maintenance teams um, they their typical daily activities they'll be responding to queries from line side neighbours lots of things like leaning fe fences investigating things like track falls, overhead stanchions leaning, um, reports of landslides by train drivers, holes in the, in the set, or, or in the case of the one at the bottom left, that was a hole that was discovered, I think, um, during a track renewal. So, so that's actually in the forefoot with the, with the track off. Um, and that kind of thing gets reported to us a lot. Quite quite frequently, it's an old drainage system that's, that's um, defunct um, or out of use and has collapsed. Um, the middle, or the, sorry, the second one is the horse for the mining settlement one we, we looked at earlier. And then the next one is actually um, a site at Harlington. I think I've got a couple more photos to show you of that. But you can see the leaning fence at the toe of the slope. And uh, the other photograph is actually at the top of that slope. And that, sh that you should be able to see there's a track fault there. You can see the equipment that the, the track teams have been leaving as they're trying to, trying to treat that fault. 
so that's kind of the maintenance team's day to day activity. They also um, remit um, kind of minor works. So previously we've we've typically done this very reactively. So when someone tells us there's a problem um, or we, we happen to see that there is a problem somewhere and since kind of just before the pandemic, we had started this and then we truly got into it, it during, during those early lockdown days. We, we used much bigger work banks and that's allowed us to have kind of proactive maintenance um, and use the larger work banks. It, it, it's meant that we've been able to be a lot more efficient um, and it, it's allowed the, the contractors and their teams to kind of do the work in a very efficient way. Um, and you, you can see the, the, you know, the photo there shows you the kind of activity they've been doing. And that so that proactive maintenance work then it's intended to reduce unplanned incidents and prevent deterioration of the assets. So you know ultimately prevent these earthwork failures from happening. Um, weather management. Some of you may have seen this before. So we use in, in eastern region, well across the, the country, we use a precipitation analysis tool. So each day we get this an email alert which looks like the the top right hand side so it is it, it shows you each of our locations we've got about 100 locations across our um our region that we're concerned about so um we get alerted so each of those shows kind of green when it's a small amount of rain due but as as the ground becomes more saturated and more rain is forecast that will go into the yellow the amber or the, the red and what our team do each day as those alerts come through, we'll review them and then we will um, send one of our contractors out if we want them to go and check things like culverts or drainage ditches to make sure that they're you know, going to be able to withstand the heavy rain and ensure there's no blockages. And that, that's been working reasonably well. I'm sure there's plenty of things we can do to improve on it, but that's 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 kind of a, a that's our standard business as usual at the moment with that. So that's for regular rain, for convective rainfall. Um, and this this was um, one of the the things that came out of post Carmont. We have a new convective analysis tool. So what we've done is we've identified different operational route sections. And we've reviewed each of those operational route sections and we've identified whether we think it's a high risk, medium risk or low risk. And those those high risk route sections, for example, if anybody knows the Newcastle Carlisle line, that line is, is you know, has lots and lots of earthworks. It's in the, the, the valley going down to the River Tyne and, you know, just the, that whole route. If you've got convective uh, uh, rainfall expected there, what we do is we put a 40 mile an hour speed on until after the event has, has passed and we're sure that the line is clear. Um, there are other stretches which we've put either in the lower medium where there's no, you know, there's no earthworks or there's, you know, the earthworks are so small, there's never been any history, there's no, you know, the land around it is flat, etc. That that we've we've allowed those in the lower of the medium. Um, and that that again is seems to be working quite well um, between control and our maintenance teams and our on-call engineers. That's kind of um, working working smoothly at the moment. So that's our convective rainfall. So then some of the other stuff that the maintenance teams do, um, they're managing landslip incidents. So they, they'll lead the recovery following a landslip and they'll liaise with the contractor, the designer, the delivery team, ops teams, track maintenance, et cetera, kind of trying to minimize disruption and ensuring that we're doing what we, you know, what whatever we need to do to get the railway reopened as safely as possible. Um, and, and so, so this uh, image here is from a site at Connington on the East Coast Main Line. I think that milepost is about 66 miles or something. And you can see the little sketch that we did to, to show what we thought was going on. I mean, it is obviously just a sketch, um, but then we've got a sketch of, of the, the repair that was being planned. And um, you can see a, an image of it being starting to be constructed, the shear key being constructed there. Um, and this is an aerial image of the of the fix as it's progressing. You can see the shear key has been has been constructed in the left hand photo and you can see topsoil being being placed on the right hand image. And then just to show you the kind of, of stuff that the maintenance teams need to, to do is kind of 
review programs and plans with the contractors um, and the, the deliverers to make sure that we, you know, we're just doing everything right and that we're not missing anything out and that we don't end up kind of doing our bit, but never having made sure that someone was going to come in and tamp, um, et cetera. So that's the, the kind of thing that the maintenance teams do. Here's another example. I included it because I, I quite liked the little sketch. You, those it, those photos you recognise from earlier. That's the, the site at Harlington, um, and again a little sketch about what we what we thought was going on and, and what we were planning on doing. Um, and then this one here is what that looks like after it was built. Um, we put piles in at that particular site, and then filled the ground behind it. Um, so, so that that's the maintenance teams. They, they, um, it's it's a whirlwind. I would say the maintenance teams' uh, uh, roles, um, it never never the same day twice. I think the renewals work bank um, is a, a kind of a, a longer term kind of view um, on life that people have. So, so the type of interventions that we um, carry out. Well, we've got three types of interventions on three earthwork types. So renewals, refurbishment and maintains. A renew will be building a stone berm or doing piles or something. And I, I've said here it's circa 250k. It it could be like it, it, it varies across across the country and um, that renewal cost. But what I was trying to show here was the kind of the scale of difference. You're talking about a renewal might be two, three, four hundred. A refurbishment is more like 40, 50, 60. You know, it's in the tens and maintain, maintains are, are in the less less than 10,000. Um, per intervention. So that's just to give you a, a flavour. Those aren't set in stone, those figures. Um, so, so large renewal schemes. I mentioned Morpeth earlier. That's This is another sketch of the site at Morpeth and, and the problem that we encountered there. And, and this particular sketch is a temporary solution um, that we've uh, carried out, that this bit is finished now, where we've drained the hillside with those inclined drains. To, to draw down the, the groundwater level um, and then as well as installing some sheet piles at the toe in order to kind of slow the movement while we plan to install big piles. So which is aren't shown on this this sketch um, and those big piles are due to start in about a month or two. Um, so that's more, but that's the kind of activity. Brownies, some of you may know Brownie. It's also known as Burnie Gill Bank just south of Durham. Um, and just to give you a, a scale of this hillside failure, you can see it's about it's all like 200 metres from from crest to toe to the river. Um, and the, as they were building the embankment, I think they had problems from the very start. And you can kind of see that um, in the, the, the ground investigation sh showed where the, you know, the, the natural ground um, interface with the embankment material. And you can see that. Kind of every time they built the embankment, it would kind of slip a little, so they had to add more and add more, and that's why it looks looks like that shape. So that's kind of some of the large renewal schemes. Um, for delivering renewals work banks, so we've got a process map how how to get renewals work delivered, and you know th this this guides us through how to go from you know we know we need works works are required, adding it to the work bank. What kind of you know things do we need to do in order to get it accepted into a constrained work bank? We need to have a problem statement. Do we need some more ground investigation? And then we, we bring that proposal for work through a peer review process, um, which I, I think I said I said at our last one, I think it's my favourite meeting of the period because um, we get to, you know, we, we get somebody who, who has a, a problem and who's concerned about something will bring and do a really good summary for the rest of the team about what they think the issue is, or if, if they're not sure yet, what, how much they do know and, and where they want to go next. And then they get kind of technical advice as well as very practical advice from the rest of the team about what to do next with it. And it, it's 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 definitely it's a, it's a good session, that one. Um, once it's in the constrained work bank and we know what kind of activity we want, the, we need to write a specification for it. Um, we need to get authority, plan it, et cetera, work with our deliverers. Um, be before we can actually get to site and start the works, but that's that's the kind of um, uh, tools that our teams use. We've we've got various um, kind of standard templates, and again, you know, through through the process of continuous improvement, we're always trying to make make these better and make it more um, uh, effective and efficient. It's renewals, 
Here's some images from recent ish renewals. We've got some rock cutting work on the left. We've got Hessel Foreshore, if anybody knows that, and the River Humber. It looks very misty there, or you might have been able to see the Humber Bridge in the distance. Um, th that's the, the footpath um, that runs along the, the edge of the river um, and between the river, between the shore and the railway. And then we've got some piles going in at a embankment, I think, which was called Hartley. But you can see some piles, some cess restraint, cess restraint being installed. OK, um, so the examinations team, we've got, uh, I've got one senior asset engineer um, who's got six asset engineers working for her and one assistant asset engineer. It's, it's the first time that we've had um, an assistant asset engineer in our team. So I'm really pleased with that because it means we can start, you know, the idea of having kind of sustainability of, of our organisation where we can get you know, graduates potentially coming in if, the, if they're suitable for it. And we can kind of train people up um, to be part of the, the Network Rail geotechnical community. Um, which, you know, I, I did a lot of Earthworks examinations myself um, uh, back when I was with Donaldson's, and it's a really, really good way of getting to know, to getting to know the assets and getting to know the, the kind of the geography. So the examinations team, they'll be planning and delivering the, the work bank um, in order to manage risk and compliance. That's it's tricky at the moment, I have to say, um, but we, we have an end goal in sight. Um, so so I think I think we've it's within our gift. The fact that these examiners are part of our team, which is which is really good. Um, so the idea is that they will also specify and instruct reactive minor work. So when they're out and about and they see that a, a, a ditch is is partially blocked, you know, it's not something that they need to ring control for because they think it's a, you know, a, an immediate danger, but it's something that they think should go in a work bank to be done, say, in the next eight weeks or something. Um, the, the, we haven't built this yet, but the idea is that they will be able to kind of create that instruction and it will go to the maintenance teams who will then either review it or you know they'll they'll have a process where they can get that added in and so it'll, it'll shorten the time between somebody on site noticing a problem and us getting something done about it um, they'll also be providing support to the maintenance teams in in kind of managing building and managing these work banks, these day to day work banks and the the maintenance and refurbishment ones, um, they, they will. They haven't yet, but they will be you know, helping with writing remits or preparing remits and visiting sites both during and after works. Um, they've also they have already started helping with this, with liaising with um, the community relations team, supporting um, you know, when we have neighbours or third parties saying that they've got a problem. They've been helping going and visiting those sites um, and then uh, responding to incidents as well. Um, in daylight hours is how we've been using them. Um, compliance and support, sorry, I don't have a pretty picture for this. So, so they're helping us by kind of trying to make it easy to measure how we're doing, which there is a lot of data and there's a lot of tools and systems which, which can make it really difficult to answer what seems like really sim simple questions. And the compliance teams are helping us kind of build tools that will talk to each other automatically. We don't need to dig through data or wonder, do we have the right, you know, the right version of the download or whatever. So, so that's that's the intention. And they have made huge strides in the last couple of years. But as I'm sure everybody knows, as soon as you as you as soon as you start making improvement on something, you're like, oh, I think I could improve that as well. So so there, there's a lot to do, but it's it's really quite exciting what they've been able to do so far and um, building new tools and, and systems. Um, one of the things this this is the idea of this is that we'll have a landing page for our team and that we'll have easy you know single click ways of getting into um something this is this is only a concept at the moment we we haven't been able to put the time into making this right but the idea is that we will um in the coming in in the coming year um uh, and Workbank tool. This is, I think, this might be my last slide. This is, um, I'm really excited about this. It's been, it's been a while coming, but the idea is that our Workbank tool will help us with. Um, so, so one of the one of the things that's happened is that we have various spreadsheets, as I'm sure everybody is very familiar with having lots of spreadsheets, and we will, you know say that we want to do something we might start doing it and then it gets lost in the midst of time other things happen 
And so we don't have an auditable trail of, of how we've made decisions or why, say, for example, someone you know, said they wanted to do to do some work here and then it never kind of um, progressed. So this new work bank tool will be auditable decision making for us and for the delivery teams. And it will also be um, there'll be a place for us to be able to liaise with our off track, off track and, and drainage um, colleagues as well um, to try and make sure that we don't lose information between us. Um, we'll also be building work banks years into the future so we can start creating kind of uh, cyclical tasks for inspect you know inspecting rock netting doing scaling works taking trees off rock cuttings that kind of thing um, and i think that is me um are there any questions how do we want to do the questions okay, okay thanks very much Claire. there's a couple of questions in there uh, and i've got a, a few myself uh, in mind Th thank you very much uh, for that insight um as first question is from uh, Sankadev Chowdhury. Uh, do you want to uh, ask it yourself, uh, Sankadev? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thanks, yeah. So, so my question is, uh, can you share any examples of uh, interventions done on depot ground when the depots are, uh, if the depot is built on a landfill, uh, marshy ditches or salt pans? Was the approach to replace natural ground with better soil, with higher safe bearing capacity, or it was, or the approach was to use piles? Uh, with well, that kind of example, if you can share some example of such, and in the same connection, if you look, uh, do you also look at some long-term settlements and accept some as uh, some long-term settlements as an acceptable risk, or uh, what was the approach? I just want to understand the approach in in this kind of marshy land building depots or buildings on marshy lands? Yeah, so we wouldn't normally be be drawn in on, on kind of the construction of, of buildings. Um, you know, we, we do have geotechnical expertise, but we're not normally part of that. Um, I think if there's if there's mining, we might we might be called in to 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 kind of sign off on designs if there's when there's mining. Um, so I, I don't have any examples of that, I'm afraid, that I can think of. In terms of if, you, if we're building railways on compressible ground, so marshy ground, I think originally they just assumed it would sink and they would just throw more material on it. Um, and a lot of that settlement has happened by now. There is there is some ongoing, and especially if conditions change, like the you know the ground dries up or the ground gets wetter, for example, um, we might continue to get settlement. Um, and it, it would be between ourselves and the track maintenance teams to understand the impact of that. How much, you know, what, how is it impacting? How often do they need to go back in and add stone to it? Um, and if, if it's unsustainable, then we might look at what we would do in terms of geotechnical um, improvements. I'm not sure I've answered all your questions there. No, thanks. It was nice. Thanks. Yeah. But I think I can add a little bit to that, Claire. Uh, 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 in terms of, I was involved in a job on the Docklands Light Railway in the 1980s. It is a few years ago, and we did uh, do some uh, ground stabilisation there in terms of using stone columns. Uh, but whether that's used anymore, I don't know. So that's quite interesting, and 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 I think that's another potential subject for discussion uh, another day. So thanks for that, Sankadov. Uh, right, Tony Morgani, uh, you've got a question there. Do you want to ask it yourself, Tony? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me all right, Paul. Yep, we can hear you. Thanks, Tony. Cool, just checking. Hotel Wi-Fi connections and all that. Um, you've mentioned, Claire, that you've got the, the precipitation analysis tool and the convective alert tool um, in place. But in terms of, of climate change and likely increases in, in that range, <laughs> is there anything you're finding yourself having to do with the assets to improve their resilience in the face of that? Or is it a bit of a case of... You know, yeah, happens? yeah. so when we do renewal schemes, we do specify that they should be looking at climate change. I can't remember the exact details of what, what we've said we want them to, to consider. Um, the, we're, we're building our CP7 work bank at the moment and we are looking at, so, so the, the, the complication with earthworks and with, with what we do is that everything we do improves the resilience against, against any kind of rain. That's the idea. Um, and 
so we tend we tend to kind of that would be part of what we're doing. We do, however, we have identified some locations where we've said, OK, th this one is specifically to do with weather resilience. Um, so. So, so, yeah, so, so we've got some schemes that would be. But as I say, the renewal schemes would be we need to take that into account when we're building drainage systems. Um, yeah, hope that hope that helps. I'm not sure I fully answered it. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. OK, thanks, Tony. Uh, next question I've got is from Jerry Manley. Uh, would you like to ask your question, Jerry? Yeah, hi, Claire. How are you? OK, we can hear you. Thanks. Uh, th thanks very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, interesting as always to hear from you. Um, on, on the convective storms, uh, emergency speed restrictions, uh, as you know, on the Settle Kalil, we used to run off of rain gauges and we'd uh, stop in, and end boards. <coughs> How are you uh, implementing that? Is it from signal to signal, or is there some other approach? So that's a good question. So it was the it was the operational team, it was control who identified the the operational route sections. So I I'm not certain how they're doing it, whether it's from junction to junction. Um, but they were so they said right. This is the stretch. The, this is where it's easy for us to put a speed on from here to here. And yeah. then we reviewed it for what we thought the risk was, if that makes sense. Um, and like occasionally there were some some stretches which were, you know, 40 miles long. And actually we yeah. only had a bit where we were really concerned for 10 miles. So we, we so so we then tweaked the operational route sections, if that makes yeah, sense. Yes, like, like all of these, I mean, you may have one cutting, you know, within it, you know, as you said, you know, 30 metres from a signal to a signal, sorry, 30 miles, you know, and you only want to, speed slow it down for you know a couple hundred meters or something like that yeah. so what about the, uh, the schedule eight costs who do they land with they don't land with me <laughs> I, 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 um I, so i'm not i'm not certain where that that, that that's that's something I, we were speaking about as well this morning actually in terms of cp7 i that's something i need to explore to understand where, where that where that goes and how i can account for it yeah, if I can just go back to the question that the chap asked before there about uh, sort of drainage, etc. Um, there is the uh, weather resilience and climate change adaptation, which that's an ANV 015. Um, there was a presentation not too long ago where HQ, they're actually looking to update all of the standards to take that into account uh, for the future as well. Obviously, the drainage 1005 already deals with that, and you have a climate change aspect associated with it, but all the other standards are due to be updated in 2024. So I don't know if that helps him uh, as well. OK, so thanks for your, thanks for that, Claire. Cheers, Ed. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks for that. Um, Joan, uh, Joan here he's got a question. Would you like to ask your question, Joan? Good, good yeah. to see yeah, you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, can can you hear me? Uh, yeah, Joe. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, thank you, Claire. Um, my question is quite simple, actually. So you, you, your team actually collects uh, lots of data there, but as a designer, we always struggle to get access to that data. So what's the easiest way actually to get um, access to that data that make our life easy as as a designers? Yeah. Not not within a network or outside the network actually for the contractors. To get access to that data yeah so we we do give some people access read only access to the earthworks database and we are always happy to be approached by you know usually what happens is that our capital delivery colleagues will be getting some work done and it, it's through them that questions would come to us about wanting to get access so it sh you should be able to get access through the project teams but if you're if, if you're struggling and that's not happening, then there's something going wrong because we should be sharing this data. Um, so if you want, to, I mean, if you wanted to send me a message and we could have a, a chat offline to see what what might be going on, because because I, I it is always it's it's almost personally upsetting when you hear that we've got this brilliant amounts of data and the people who are doing things to our assets or want to do things to our assets can't get access to it. So I, I'm happy if you, if you don't have my email address, I'm, I'm happy for you to 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 get it okay brilliant yeah thank you very much yeah i'll get in touch cheers all right all right thanks for that johan uh sorry uh now joan Heary has got some i'm still questions. here paul i'm still okay, here joan. <laughs> yeah that's right slip up there joan no, but, uh, no problem no thanks. problem hi claire thanks for a great presentation 
So just listen to what you're saying, Claire, and, and thinking in parallel in terms of what came out of that Carmont report. There was a lot of discussion in there about people not being really sure about what had actually been built and yeah. how that was assured. And therefore, and then the whole thing about provision of health and safety file information. So I was just wondering how has all of that kind of aspect impacted upon your team? Yeah, yeah, it it's something that it's not a new problem that people have recognised. And it's something that we've, you know, what happens is, is people try and follow it up and then everybody's moved on to the next project. Um, so so it is something that all of our teams, have, you know, are, have been instructed that they need to follow up and, and we need to start counting it. So, again, this is something that the compliance teams and the renewals teams will be have objectives for this year to be following up and making sure we get everything back and that it is as as per what we expected. That's one. So we've got two deliverers. We've got Capital Delivery who deliver the bigger schemes and they work mostly with the renewals team and then Works Delivery who do the kind of that day to day kind of uh, maintenance refurbishment stuff. But they also do the bigger reactive schemes. Um, and the, the where was I going with that? Um, yeah, so, so so using the Earthworks examiners when in, in the kind of the out of season time. So during the summer, the, the idea is that they will go around doing a lot, a lot of these checks of these smaller schemes that we don't often check to see what's been installed. Um, so 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 there'll be a change. So 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 yeah, the, the impact will be there'll be objectives around this for the teams this year. Um, and we'll be used, we'll be visiting more of these smaller schemes, smaller sites that we've we've often not not looked at before. Okay. Okay, John. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Claire. I've got a, a question, a couple of questions myself. Actually, I've got a little bit of time left. If you're everyone's happy to take this, uh, it's about examiners. In house or out of house, and, and what level of qualification, really, Claire? I'll be a little bit controversial here. Uh, when I worked on the on the, the, the TFL, uh, I've got a bit of a view that uh, I prefer in house because I think you can make judgments uh, in terms of and uh, mitigation appropriate. Whereas I found out outside, maybe external examiners and uh, consultants, perhaps protected there. Uh, PI a bit, perhaps that's uh, a controversial statement, naughty boy, Paul, but any opinion on that, Claire? Um, um, yeah, so I, when I was doing Earthworks exams way back when I was with Donaldson's, I did a lot of rock cutting exams and kind of got interested in, in you know, what happened these exams, who did what with them, how, how do they know what to do next, etc. And then when I joined Network Rail, I think one of the first kind of observations I made was Oh, I just want these people to be part of our team. I, you know, I, I want I want them to to know what we do, to be to be part of it, to see, you know, to see what we care about, to see how we get things done, and to help us make better decisions. So, so absolutely, that, that I I really like having them as part of our team. You know, it is still we're still in the first kind of the first year of it, and um, so that you know there's going to be some bumps along the way, but I, I think it will give us, uh, you know, medium to long term, really good outputs. OK, and then following that up, if I may, then in terms of managing that uh, resource uh, through winter and summer, because uh, I recall that it was better to inspect slopes with less vegetation. Uh, so you'd get that balance. Any any comment on that? Yeah, so so that's that's the intention is that they will be mostly out and about kind of four or five days a week doing exams in the winter time. Um, as as we remove vegetation from slopes that they shouldn't have vegetation on, we will be able to do some earthworks exams in the summertime, especially when the days are lighter. So if, if the vegetation is, is low enough, then you, you can do them. Um, but we've, one of the other things that we need to start doing is looking at our outside party slopes and doing in, examinations of those. And the idea is that they will be doing those in the summertime, um, as well as helping the maintenance teams, you know, responding to queries, checking work that's been that, you know, that has been instructed, writing remit. So they will they'll become an integral part of that maintenance team during the summer months, um, as well as, you know, doing examinations. OK, thanks. Uh, and that sort of 
uh, leads me on to other things. It's interesting that you say you're looking at third party slopes. So that's quite interesting. So I guess you've got to negotiate with third parties to get access at some at some times, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and uh, also the issue about vegetation that you mentioned. I've noticed a little bit more clearance going on, which is great. But have you got any uh, experience and issues with the sort of ecologists, uh, the ecology side of it? And uh, any short stories you might want to share or experience? Um, so obviously removal of, of trees has is is a big, can be a big issue. Um, so we need to do it, you know, sensitively and make sure that we have, you know, done everything we need to about engagement with communities and ensuring that we're doing everything in line with with, um, you know, the ecological requirements, etc. Um, it can be controversial. Um, so so that's kind of for removing trees for inspections. We will often just remove, you know, windows onto the cutting or onto the, to the embankment. So you might just do strips so that you can just, you know, see through the, the undergrowth. So it kind of it it varies. Yeah, so, so, so veg but yeah, vegetation can be controversial, but <laughs> um, we, we can't we can't leave, yeah, we can't leave trees go on rock cuttings, you know, it's just yeah. OK, well, we've got no more questions. And I think we've had a good session. Uh, I, I'm not really going to invite any other questions unless there's an absolute uh, must ask out there. Uh, but I think that was really great overview. Thanks, Claire. I say it's very topical uh, and uh, I, I always learn uh, something myself. Uh, and so thank you so much for such an interesting paper. Uh, uh, well, peace at lunchtime. Thanks very much. Thanks to your team who support you and for your colleagues. It's great to see the, pit, the sharing, the peer review. I, c I can't support that enough. I've always found that helpful and not enough of that was done uh, in my era, 70s to the 90s. Uh, so thanks for that. And I hope everyone enjoyed the session. Uh, look out for further PWI Lunch and Learns on Tuesdays. Uh, of course, there's always your section meetings now with some face to face. So please make an effort to come along. Great for networking. And there's those seminars. I mentioned the one in Birmingham. So um, thanks very much, Claire. Uh, and uh, I look forward to meeting you at some stage. So anyone wants to sort of linger and ask a question, by all means, I will stay a little while, whether Claire's got time. So, so thanks for joining us. Okay. Thanks very thanks much, everyone.